This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. If you click on the link in the description below, it'll take you to their store and they'll know I sent you there. Hello everyone, I'm Nita Hone, and it's Wednesday, so that means it's time for another MTG Top 10, the series where I rank cards based on their historical performance at Magic's highest level of competition. Today, I'm going to be looking at one of the game's most popular and successful creature types, Merfolk. According to Wizards, Merfolk are the representative or characteristic race for blue. This means that they are a populous group that has their own civilization and culture on many different planes, and that they represent what blue is all about. Overall, merfolk have been a very successful creature type, with merfolk tribal decks finding success in every single format at one point or another. That was enough for merfolk to come in at number 5 on my top 10 on the best tribal decks ever, and if I redid that video today, I actually think they would move up a couple of spots. And if you haven't seen that top 10 on the best tribal decks, you should. In addition to good merfolk tribal decks, the game has also seen its fair share of merfolk who are powerful individually. Anyway, to be eligible for this list, a card had to either have the merfolk creature type or be capable of making merfolk creature tokens. Using those criteria, 229 cards were eligible for consideration, and in this video, we'll talk about the 10 that have left the biggest impact on competitive magic. Before we get started, here's a quick reminder on how I score cards in these videos. A Pro Tour, Mythic Championship, Players Tour, as well as Legacy or Vintage Championship Top 8 is worth 2 points, and a Grand Prix or Magic Fest Top 8 is worth 1 point. At number 10, it is Curse Catcher, a 1-mana 1-1 one -one merfolk that can sacrifice itself to force spike instants or sorceries. It has largely been played in merfolk tribal decks, gaining points in such decks in almost every format it's ever been legal in. The sacrifice effect is great for merfolk decks because it usually means buying your aggressive deck one extra turn before you need to worry about a board sweeper, and on top of that, of course, it goes well with all of your merfolk payoffs, which usually means it can do some real damage before giving itself up for the cause. While Curse Catcher hasn't gained any points since 2017, it is probably a good idea to assume it will gain more points in the future. Merfolk decks just never seem to go away permanently. At number 9, it is Marrow Regeray, a Merfolk Lord. One of the things that Merfolk have going for them is that they have more lords than any other creature type does, and that gives Merfolk decks a ton of redundancy in terms of finding one of these creatures that pumps all their Merfolk. Regeray does the usual lord thing of giving plus one plus one, and it brings the extra value of tapping or untapping stuff when you cast merfolk spells. This can be great for enabling your merfolk army to attack after tapping down an opposing blocker. Marrow Regeray has points in merfolk tribal decks in every format it's ever been legal in. At number eight, I have actually included two cards, Jade Light Ranger and Merfolk Branchwalker. The Ranger is the legitimate number eight, while if the Branchwalker had been given its own slot, it would have been number 10, pushing Curse Catcher off of the list. I decided to put them together because they are such similar cards. Both are Merfolk from the Plane of Ixalan, a plane where Merfolk occupy the blue-green color pair, and both of them come with the Explore mechanic. Explore is personally one of my favorite mechanics ever, and it gives both of these reasonably costed creatures a lot of value. With each of these, no matter what the outcome is, you're getting your mana's worth or more. With the Branch Walker, you're either getting a 2-mana 3-2 or a 2-mana 2-1 that draws you a card. With the Ranger, there are more potential outcomes because it explores twice. It can be a 3-mana 2-1 that draws you 2 cards, a 3-mana 3-2 that draws you 1, or a 3-mana 4-3. You have a little control over this one too, because if you really need that 4-3 and you reveal a non-land card on the first Explore, you just put it back and it will hit the same non-land. Explore also has the extra benefit of giving you a bit of card selection in graveyard filling if you want it, because you can put a non-land card it reveals into your graveyard. Both of these were played in standard Sultai and Golgari aggro decks that had an Explore sub-theme. These decks ran Wild Growth Walker. Playing the Walker on turn 2 and Jade Light Ranger on turn 3 is a pretty insane start to a game. Neither of them have any points outside of standard so far, but it wouldn't be too crazy to see them gain points in Pioneer or Historic. At number 7 it is Thassa's Oracle, which was printed in Theros Beyond Death, meaning it is the newest card on this list and it's still legal in standard. The Oracle gives you some powerful card selection, provided you can get your blue loyalty high enough, letting you choose a card to put on top of your library from the top X cards of your library. That's a pretty nice effect already, especially on a somewhat reasonable 2-mana 1-3, but the Oracle's real power comes from the fact that it is an alternate win condition. If your devotion is higher than the number of cards in your library, you win the game on the spot. That might sound like it's sort of hard to achieve, and in most normal situations, 
It is, but the Oracle can be paired with other cards to be a very consistent win condition. In Pioneer, it was played alongside Inverter of Truth, and this combo deck was so successful that the Inverter had to be banned from Pioneer. While the Oracle doesn't have any points outside of Pioneer just yet, it is being played in Modern, Legacy, and Vintage combo decks, all of which seek to win the game with Thassa's Oracle's trigger. At number 6, it is Silver Gill Adept, another merfolk with a tribal payoff. Paying 5 mana for a 2-1 that draws you a card is not great, but if you can reveal a merfolk when you cast this, it only costs 2 mana, and that's a really good deal, especially when you have a bunch of lords around to pump it. Like a lot of the best merfolk tribal payoffs, the Adept has been played in just about every format it's ever been legal in. It also has the benefit of having been reprinted in Ixalan block, which means it may find success in Pioneer or Historic Merfolk decks in the future. At number 5, it is Merfolk Looter, which is, unsurprisingly, a Merfolk that loots. This is actually where we get the slang term for the draw a card, discard a card effect. Looting is a nice effect, especially when you don't have to pay mana to do it. It helps you rip through your library faster and loads up your graveyard. In Standard and Extended, it was used to help enable cards with madness like Circular Logic. If you discard a card with madness, you aren't really looting anymore. You're just drawing a card, so that's pretty sweet. It was also played in Psychotog Control decks where it could help you make your Psychotog even larger. It was also played some in Standard its second time through the format in Blue-White Delver decks. At number 4, it is Lord of Atlantis, the first Merfolk Lord ever printed, and one of the three Lords that appeared way back in Magic's very first set, Alpha. The Lord pumps all your Merfolk while also granting them Island Walk. It is notable that every other Lord that gives plus one plus one and a Land Walk ability to all other creatures of the type cost three mana, while Lord of Atlantis is only two mana, which is a great deal for how much damage he tends to add to the board. Lord of Atlantis helped spawn the first successful tribal deck in Magic's history, when it appeared in a mono blue fish deck that top aided the extended Pro Tour, Pro Tour Rome in 1998. From there, it has gone on to appear in Merfolk decks in every format it's ever been legal in. At number three, it is Master of Waves, which is another Merfolk that's a Lord, but this one doesn't actually pump Merfolk, instead it pumps Elementals. Master of Waves brings a bunch of Elementals into play when he comes down. On his own, he will be four mana for a 2-1 that also makes a 2-1 creature token, which is not a bad deal, especially for a baseline, and most of the time it's going to be bringing a lot more to the table than that. The Master does have the downside that if it dies, all of its elemental friends will die too, but the efficiency here is great and worth the risk. And hey, protection from red does mean it can't be killed by a lot of cheap burn spells at least. Master of Waves helped make Devotion to Blue decks one of the best decks in Standard, and it's gained several points in modern Merfolk decks as well. At number two, I have True Name Nemesis, which was originally printed in Commander 2013, which means that it's never been legal in Standard or Modern. Instead, it's only been legal in Legacy and Vintage, and yet, it's number two on this list. Protection from a player is a very powerful thing, because it means the opponent can do nothing to interact directly with the Nemesis. They can't block, they can't target it with spells. The Nemesis can die to board sweepers and edict effects, but that's about it. Three power and protection for only three mana means this thing has done a ton of damage in the Eternal formats, where it can come down as early as turn one or two. In Legacy, it is regularly featured in bug decks, but also Delver, Threshold, and Stoneblade. It just provides an excellent and difficult to deal with win condition for those decks. It also makes use of the Merfolk creature type in Vintage, where it's a big part of making Merfolk decks viable in that format. And at number one, it is Tidebinder Mage, a Merfolk who hoses red and green decks. While it might look like it would mostly be a sideboard card, it has actually gained the majority of its points in the main deck. It didn't always have a target to tap down, but it had one often enough that standard devotion to blue decks were perfectly happy to run it, especially because at worst, it was a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two that still added 2 to your devotion in the early game. The same has been true in modern merfolk decks, where if it doesn't have a target, it still provides you with an additional merfolk for all your deck's various tribal synergies. It is very likely that Tidebinder Mage will be overtaken by True Name Nemesis in the near future, as the Nemesis is only 4 points behind it and is more actively putting up points. Tidebinder's last point came more than 3 years ago. Well, that does it for this MTG Top 10. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch future MTG Top 10s, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. And if you want to catch up on the almost 300 of them I've already done, you should see the playlist on your screen now. Thanks for watching.